Hello students, welcome to EPG Patshala. My name is DK Bhattacharya. I will be talking about Upper Paleolithic art of Europe. Now, before we go to describe the Upper Paleolithic art evidences or Paleolithic art evidences, we must emphasize the point that this is the first time we are getting evidence of prehistoric man's mental mental map mindset map and mindset in the sense the anxieties and agonies of man the happiness and the weaknesses of man are reflected in these activities which the antiquities in terms of toolkit never did the study of prehistoric art had a very peculiar beginning a man called paolo sartulo in 1800 something uh, discovered uh, some art in an accidental way at a cave in Lascaux and he represented them and he copied them and represented them into the intellectual bodies and said this is Paleolithic art and everybody laughed at him. Nobody accepted them as Paleolithic art because they looked very very fresh and they say prehistoric antiquity cannot look so fresh. So its beginning was very very hesitant for a long time. Then there is a man called uh, Henry Abbe Broy, who got some money from the Prince of Monaco. And with the money of the Prince of Monaco, he started looking for the cave sites and recording those art objects. And after he recorded those art objects, it took long time and he wrote a book called 400 Centuries of Art. Now this is in French, this book. And this for, for the first time, art became a scientific study material in archaeology. Although most of the people who worked in archaeology, uh, they would never work in art. The people who work in art are basically those who are artists themselves. So here is a kind of common plane for artists along with archaeologists. The reason is archaeological raw material, the archaeologists study chronology, archaeologists studies antiquities. Here you cannot, in art you cannot study chronology, you cannot study antiquities with any kind of modern, modern category or methodology. So it remained a gray area for both the disciplines for a long time. Anyway, then when it, it was accepted as a scientific discipline, people started formulating the stages of art and the two variety of art was identified. One was called art mobilier or home art. Art mobilier and home art is, is, is includes only those objects which are art executed in mobile or movable objects like the Venus of Willendorf that we've talked about. Now you can take the Venus from one place to another. It was called art mobilia. The other variety was called art parietal. Art parietal or rock art or cave art. Now this art parietal was referring to those art executed on the floor, the ceiling or the walls of the caves which remain unmovable. So these were a separate category. Now, uh, Henry Abbe Broy, first time, he is a very excellent work he has done. He said, all right, there is no possibility of doing chronology, but I will in the, any way do a chronology of the art on the basis of stylization from simple to complex. So from simple stylized to complex stylization, he made four categories, chronological categories. And these are called stage one, stage two, stage three, and stage four. Stage one was taken as the most primitive form of art. He says these are bare outline of the animal forms, the bare outline of the animal forms and without no anatomical details or such anatomical details as the hoof or the knee joint or the mane or even the eyes, single line depressions. And this was identified as belonging to Upper Perigordian. Upper Perigordian was to be about 27,000 BCE. This is the oldest. The second stage was taken as those where the entire outline of the animal has been completed though the basic details are still missing and they are also only in one color and these were taken as belonging early upper Magdalenian. Then came the stage three where for the first time anatomical details started showing. That means the mane of the horse's body, the eyes and the sockets and even the hoof even the hoof and the knee joint was uh, demonstrated. So this was more or less complete uh, representation of the animal and it was taken as stage three. This was middle, middle Magdalenian.
and finally stage four was the one in which multi-chrome painting was done several colors were used and the contour of the body was also shown as if the belly is protruding so the lighter color is used to show the protruding part of the contour of the belly. so this was a kind of rough shot explanation of the chronology nobody liked it and uh, there is a gentleman called bednari who felt that it is wrongly used or it has been wrongly used to create a chronology of the art and he created another technique where the line deposit on art or kind of deposit fine film of deposits on art were scraped through and they were put under chemical analysis to date them however this uh, this technique remained basically a guiding principle for anybody working in art prehistoric art it, it always remained a guiding principle so prehistoric art, as Broy wrote in his book, uh, was uh, made to study under the four headings. One is the motif. The other is the area of uh, representation, orientation and representation. Third was the, uh, the, the uh, animals represented and the area they are represented. And fourth is interpretation. So the four kinds of uh, categories were formed to study art. Now these were the methodologies laid down. Obviously it has reaped very good uh, uh, evidences and very good analysis of books of the art objects. The first point is motif. When you look at the motif that is presented in let's say the first cave, the Lascaux, that was discovered. And of course, Altamira was discovered almost around the same time. And uh, Altamira is in Spain, Lascaux is in France. And uh, if we concentrate on these two uh, cave sites, which are world famous cave sites, then we'll find that most of the representations are either bovids or horses. Bovids or horses and then followed by uh, reindeers or cervides, all varieties of cervides. Mammoths, or carnivores are the least represented motif, number one. Number two, they seem to show a high degree of superimposition. There is so much of superimposition that one animal is drawn and on the top of the same animal, another animal is drawn and on the top of the second animal, a third animal is drawn. So one can't make what has been drawn and these superimpositions make it a very complex phenomena. But it simply shows one point, that these were not made for enjoyment. Because if you want to enjoy creating an object by your art, you definitely won't spoil it by drawing another art object on top of it. So superimposition seems to be a very important character of cave, cave painting. Number two, there are areas where cave painting is found, if you go into the cave, large areas of open, uh, walls are available but no painting has been done. You go inside in a dark narrow corner, inside you go down in a shaft and under the shaft you find a very beautiful panel of painting done. So all the paintings that occur, occur in very small uh, far off places in the cave and they are not on the usual area where people can observe and enjoy. And another point that is very important, there seems to be indication of their having been done in a kind of a secrecy. We do not know why they have been done in some secret area, non-available area. In some places it is so small a shaft, it is, there is a shaft in, in Lasco also, where in, it is a small area, a small panel has been made, beautiful panel has been made. Of course, there are other panels in Altamira, for instance, you have a huge horse made on the ceiling. And there is one point, most of these ceiling paintings are higher than a human height. So we have been always wondering if they have used any kind of scaffold. A scaffold of some sort has been, has to be used to reach the ceiling and do the painting. But we do not have any evidence of scaffold. Number two, we do not have any evidence of an artificial light having been used. In Lascaux, we have found the, the epiphyseal end of a large bone, which has a blackened mark and a depression and people believe could be that was used as a lamp because you know that epiphyseal part must have been scooped off and there must have been some animal fat used to use it as a light for the internal part but no scaffold has been find, found. Number three, the raw material that was used for painting is usually uh, red ochre. 
Red ochre has at least six shades of colors. Red ochre can be very strong orange, it can be brown, it can be light yellow, it can be even a lesser shade than yellow and so on. And magnesium oxide has been used for black color. So black and shades of <clears throat> brown to orange are the main component of color used in stage four or the last stage of the uh, cave paintings. Finally, finally, we find another important feature that they are not only superimposed, but their orientation are also very peculiar. For instance, you can find a large, large reindeer or large cervidae uh, standing with the legs towards the floor. And on the body of the same large animal, in the belly of that cervidae, a small mammoth has been made with the legs facing the uh, ceiling. So the orientation of the anatomical orientation of the animals are also not similar. And this shows that there has been superimpositions without taking care of even the anatomical position or the relative size of the animals. And in along with that, along with that, in most of the cases, you find there are very peculiar kinds of palm prints. We, they call it hand prints in books, but I think it should be uh, correctly uh, spoken as palm prints. Now, palm prints can be of two kinds. One is dip your hand in paint and, and push it on the wall. The other can be put the hand there and spray, spray uh, color on top of it. So it is called a negative palm print or stenciled palm print. These palm prints are enigmatic. We do not know what were the functions of these palm prints. We do not know anyway what were the functions of those animal depictions. And there is a cave called La Gargas where there are 700 palm prints. So there must be a special cave that you go there and put your palm prints, then you will get an animal hunted today or your wishes will be fulfilled. It seems like that, I can't say. But Gargas is a very peculiar cave site in France where you have 700 palm prints. Some of the palm prints are also juvenile, small palms, some are big. Another important thing, many palm prints shows the, the distal phalanxes of some of the uh, uh, fingers missing. So the phalanxes are missing and uh, like this and then uh, people thought that this represents the earliest evidence of leprosy because in leprosy fingers are sometimes broken and are sometimes are disjointed. Others said no, this must be amputations. They have been deliberately amputed. You know, rituals referring to initiation is very important and all initiation rites, male initiation rites, involve some kind of body torture. In, in, in Australia, for instance, you have the incisors knocked off during initiation in some of the tribes. Then uh, in India also, you have sometimes holes made in the earlobe during initiation. So initiation, at the male initiation at least, includes some pain or some kind of body pain to be inflicted and you go through it to become adult. Somebody said that, well, this kind of knocking off the distal end of the phalanxes must be referring to some kind of initiation right we do not know but uh, latest uh, information that has come from any another article of bednarik bednarik says no in africa he has found some tribes where they have uh, avoidance relationship with mother-in-law and daughter-in-law or mother-in-law and son uh, 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 daughter's husband and there they use sign languages and many of the sign languages involve bending down the fingers, bending down the fingers and showing a couple of middle fingers and so on. Bednarik said this is also a language. So we don't know, I mean, since it is unknown, we have just interpretations and interpretations only. So here you, you have Lascaux and Altamira showing four stages, distinct four stages of art and each one of them having their own peculiarities. but. One point is common to both of them. Carnivores are very few. Carnivores are not shown so much. Let us look at the interpretation. But before you go to the interpretation, let us also talk about the art mobilier. Art mobilier that we have, the hundreds of uh, animal figurines, for instance, in Dolny Westonis, we have a large number of animal figurines. We have also uh, 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 
um, ornaments of one pendant kind or ornaments of some kind or the other. The Magdalenian batten the commandments, Magdalenian harpoons, Magdalenian dart, dart throwers are replete with beautiful engravings of animals. One of them is so classical, two mammoths is combating with each other neck to neck. So there are beautiful engravings done in movable objects and there is no end of it. And the classic part of this uh, movable object or art mobilia is the Venus or female figurine. Willendorf is one, Dolny Westernis is another. The raw material of Dolny Westernis is different. But his character is the same. Dolly Westernis art material or the female figurine is very interesting. It, she has a face. But then the secondary sexual traits are exaggerated. But in place of eye, there are two slits made. And on the top of the skull, there are four slits made. And these four slits, possibly it is believed, must have been used to insert some kind of ornamentation for ritual purpose. We don't know. But there is another thing. She seems to have a girdle kind of a thing, uh, which is around the waist. So you have some difference of these female figurines, but art mobiliar is dominated by female figurines. You come to Central Europe, you go to Eastern Europe, you go to Balkans, Petrana for instance, you have large number of these mobile uh, objects, art mobiliar, which are female figurines. There are, uh, there are ornaments also. The, in mezzanine, you have armband taken from elephant uh, ivory. So you have uh, ornaments, you have animal forms, you have um, um, stylized female forms. Uh, Dolly Weston is known for those stylized female forms, some of them like pendants and so on. So here are two groups. Some believe that Central Europe does not have so many caves. Possibly that is why Central Europe does not have cave art, but it has mobile art. It has home art. And Spain and southern France, that is Franco-Cantabrian region, has a large number of caves. That is why they have the, uh, uh, the cave art. But it is not true because recently we have found that in Coa Valley in Portugal, for instance, along the river Douro, you find a huge number of open air rock engravings and that has been declared as a world heritage site. The same way you have in northern Italy, the Valcamonica group of sites, which are again engravings, large amount of engravings. Usually engravings are referring to female figure, uh, uh, animal forms and not female figurines, I'm sorry. And these are also world heritage sites. So it is not true that one has to have rock shelters or caves to have art. It's true that the art in the rock shelters or caves are multi-chrome uh, dis uh, display. But here in the open area, they are engravings are done with Without painting of any kind. They are mostly engraving. There are some places, some kind of in painting also used. Last and not the least is the, uh, and, and this not the least part is the, uh, occupied the most, most description and discussion, the interpretation. Why of this art? Some of uh, us in the beginning has just, just thrown it away as an art for art's sake. They made it because they enjoyed it. They made these depictions of animals because that is the way they perceived the world around them and they were all the time looking at the animals passing their, their, their habitation area and they said, well, why not represent it? The sum says, no, it's not as simple as that because if you wanted to create art for art's sake, then you want to superimpose one over the other and destroy the art. You know, some of the superimpositions are so complicated that you don't even know what animal is being shown. There are three times, four times superimposition. So they said, no, 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 it can't be art for art's sake. It must be something else. Now what something else made them choose a place and do these error executions sometimes in a very secretive manner. I use the word secretive because they are found in a very non-accessible corners and shafts in the cave and when large amount of empty space is available in the accessible area, they don't touch it. They go to those corners to do it. So there is an element of secrecy in this kind of execution of art. Two things, the secrecy and the superimposition, both together can be taken to show that there is something happening which is not art for art's sake, obviously. And along with that, the palm prints. This also shows that it can't be art for art's sake. There must be something else in it. And then we'll go into it later on. We have uh, successfully negated the possibility of art for art's sake. 
on the ground that superimposition cannot do that, on the ground that they are done in secret places, and on the ground that there are hundreds of palm prints and some of them showing this palm, uh, the fingers broken. So these are the three grounds on which I negate the possibility of this art as art for art's sake. Now the question comes then what was it meant for? It is argued that it was meant by one, one group of scholars means that it was for initiation right. Now that came from Spencer and Gillen's work on Australian Aborigines. Spencer and Gillen were the two uh, missionaries who went to uh, convert the Australian Aborigines into Christianity and there they went into interior deserts and found the Oruntas where some Orunta males will go secretly to it. Even a female cannot see that side. They are not supposed to look there. So they will secretly go to the corner where there are large boulders there because it's a desert and they will do some drawing on the boulder which is their uh, totemic animal and only initiated males will go there, females want to be look their side and that is something they immediately picked up as an ethno-archaeological methodology and they said well prehistoric art may be also something to do with initiation rites. Now initiation is very interesting, Why? what is initiation? You see a man, a boy who is 14 years old can, uh, can make a girl pregnant but he cannot hunt for himself to feed the child. So society delays his getting married. Society says, no, you will marry only when you are 19 or you are 20. So from 14 to 20, he's, he's told about uh, folk stories, he's told about what are the things an adult should do, and he's given rights of hunting. How do you hunt? Why should you hunt? It is a very, very important thing to survive. So initiation has to involve some training in getting hunted or go getting into successful hunting. Hun hunting. So it seems that initiation may be for seven days in the, in, the, in, the, in the cave and there the boys will be taken and he'll be shown how to do hunting and this it will be a ritual of some sort or the other. This could be one reason because it is very important for a man to become adult to learn hunting. But then there are others who said, no, this is not initiation only. Of course, it can be initiation in some cases. I'm talking of interpretation. This could be also what is called sympathetic art. What is sympathetic art? I will make the drawing of an animal. I will throw stones at it. I will literally try to hurt the stone on my drawing. And thereby I will believe that if I go in real hunting, I will be able to hunt the animal. So I make a mimicry of hunting in my small place, in my cave, and I do it in a secret place. And then when I go for real hunting, I will be a successful hunter. So there are two things. One is initiation and the other is, of course, uh, sympathetic magic. But the part of initiation is also linked with fertility cult. Because in this initiation rites, you are also told about fertility. There is one drawing where a man is lying down with his phallus erect. There are very few human representations. I think there are only three or four human representations. They're all, all cave painting are always animal representations. And that to the animals of in bovids, uh, um, uh, horses and cervides, uh, seldom mammoth, seldom carnivores. So the interpretation uh, of three varieties, sympathetic art, uh, uh, initiation ritual, and of course, fertility cult are combined together. The Gargas cave, which has 700 palm prints, brings the fact that possibly the initiation used to be in stages. So on 13th birthday, you come and put your palm print and then you come on 17th birthday when some of the body torture you have gone through successfully, then your second stage you come put, put your registered mark there by way of the print and you then develop into a full adult by the time you come to the third print, possibly that is the time even the finger is distorted, I don't know. But then you are trying all the time to say that this is initiation. Somehow this doesn't click. It doesn't click because there are some places where in a very secret corner, it is known as a shaft of the dead man, a secret corner under the floor there is a shaft, a drawing has been made. So we do not know that if it is only initiation. Initiation is a public function. 
initiation cannot be alone in the secret it has to be the clients of the family who will see that the boy is getting initiated and becoming adult it has to be a group function so gargas is a very classic site where initiation can be accepted but what about the dead man's shaft in the dead man's shaft it is very secretly done in a very secret corner so there is something else happening in the mind and the something else that is happening is something we have not any clue to understand a secret execution of certain things are relieving certain forces and powers in the environment to make you a good successful hunter is possibly all the time hack uh, worrying man man is all the time worried have i not eaten of all the animals i should be able to get the food tomorrow otherwise i'll go hungry so this hunger is the imperative that is constantly working on man and he's creating his secret cult secret worship secret activities as if to call upon the forces of the nature to make him a successful fighter a successful worker thank you very much